Welcome to the Visual Storytelling Podcast. My name is Fred Ranger, and I'm so happy that you're joining us this week for another inspirational conversation. Today I have a special guest. His name is Chris Facey, and he is a photojournalist, portrait photographer, raised in Brooklyn, New York, and currently in Raleigh, North Carolina. Chris has the ability to create images that are powerful yet tender. We're going to talk about that, Chris. But first of all, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you for having me. You know what? We've been chatting uh, online. We've been also invited to the same podcast uh, and so on and so forth. But it's the first time we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So I'm excited because I've been following your work and I think it's probably one of the most, you know, some of the most powerful images I've seen in a long time. And but I, before we, we dive in into the, the work and everything, uh, can you walk our listeners through how, how you actually discovered photography and how did you, you know, actually fell in love with it? Wow. Um, well, I fell in love with photography during my time uh, in the United States Army. Um, I need I'd always been a creative individual, but I needed another like outlet. And trying to do music in the military wasn't going to happen for me. Um, I wasn't really inspired to write my poetry the way I used to. Um, I just needed something that I can do that wouldn't really get in the way of essentially being an active duty soldier um, and having to be photography. Um, I came home on leave and I saw my best friend who I consider my brother. He was telling me how much money he paid somebody to take photos of a shirt he was designing and me being so like naive and arrogant to the craft i was just like what you paid how much why would you do that bro i did it with my phone and this is crazy <laughs> like, you know i was i was one of them and he was like all right bet well you do it next time so that we can save money gave me an old camera um it happened to be one of fuji film's first digital cameras like one of their original first digital cameras like, like before x series and stuff yeah, yeah like like it was it wasn't it <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I took it back with me to Fort Drum, and I'm practicing with it. I'm taking pictures of all these different things. And I'm like, why does it not look like these that I'm seeing on the internet? What is this blurry background stuff? And what is this? Like, this camera doesn't do any of this. And the more I learned about it, I started learning about interchangeable lenses and, uh, you know, nifty 50s and different apertures. And the more I learned about it, the more in love with it I was falling. So I tried to ask some other soldiers if they had a camera that, they were they were no longer using that I can get. Long story less long, they didn't. So I applied for a military credit card, and I was extremely nervous because <laughs> me and credit don't mix. <laughs> I hate things with like credit cards and stuff like that. But I got approved, and I think it was meant to happen because I got approved for exactly the exact amount for the camera. It was like a Canon one of the T series. It wasn't one of like the eyes rebel or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was that an SD card, a camera bag and a 50 mil lens. That's all you it need, was, man. That's all you need enough for that. And I was so excited and I was like, well, I have to pay this off somehow. So I started doing, I, I started, I still thought that photography was just, I, right, maybe it's just nice pictures of people and things. Let me just, try that to pay this off. So I'm doing portrait sessions and things of that nature to pay it off. And I pay the camera off. I'm still not satisfied, but I'm carrying the camera with me everywhere. I ended up Googling black photographers and that was the end of that. My mind went, nice. I'm seeing Gordon Parks and Carrie Mae Weems, and Roy De Carava and things like that. And it's, it started, I started going down this rabbit hole. Um, and started seeing them like, I can do something like that with this, like whatever this has me feeling, I want to do that. How do I do that? And I just kept trying to get more information about it. And I just kept a camera on me and I ended up being known as the soldier walking around with the camera. Like, Hey, can you come shoot this? Can you come shoot that? Like this. And it just, I just stuck with it. Then, then the time came where it was time to get out of the military and it was either, uh, go to school to be a dental hygienist or <laughs> go to school to try to, you know, be a photographer. I think the well, choice is obvious, but you know, your, you know, your mileage may vary. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to myself, 
I, I know I'm not going to want to dig in anybody's mouth every day. So let's do this. And that way, you know, I also have two daughters. So I don't want to kind of lead from example. Like I want to take this chance to believe in myself. How can I tell them to go be whatever they want to be? But they don't, you know, let me go do it. So I did that and I didn't go to school for photography to learn how to do photography. I'll say that I went to learn how to navigate that world. This would have been my one opportunity to go to this this institution. And I have, the teachers have to answer my questions. You know, you can't leave me on red <laughs> at school. <laughs> and then from there, it's just my camera just been by my side ever since. Wow. So it's, it's very inspirational, uh, your story, because there's an aspect to it where you got basically um, involved with it through looking at other photographers' work. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, Gordon Parks. I, I mean, for me, that's probably one of the most influential photographer, uh, bar none, in, in history. Just his style and what he meant with his photo and what his photos actually um, did in, in the world. So, so can you talk a bit about, you know, that aspect of it, which is it's such an inspirational uh, uh, um, ecosystem that we're in that we feed off each other's, you know, talent and creativity. But for you, there's an extra layer, and and you did mention you Google black photographer. So, so can, can you talk a bit about that? Because I think there's a lot of people out there that they don't know where to start. They don't know how to get inspired. They they they, they know that there's cameras out there. They're expensive, but how do mm -hmm. they start? You know. Well, I know for me, uh, every time I was typing in how to like use my camera or any type of photography related thing, I didn't see anybody that looked like me, essentially. Um, I seen one or two. I think I seen something on Eli Reed, but I didn't know who Eli Reed was still. I, but I did watch that video on YouTube. And once I seen, once I typed in specifically black photographers, seeing people that not only looked like me but came from the same or similar environments as me being held to these high standards for creating photographs that are like i didn't even know you can do that like nobody put a camera in my hand as a kid and said you can be a photographer like they never said that but i was more more drawn to that feeling it hit me and i was like okay i want whatever that is i want to do that it wasn't the portraiture because it wasn't none of that. It was just whatever that was, whatever this photo is. How did he? I think it, what image I saw. I think I saw the image that Gordon Parks made of the Fontanelle's family at the welfare. Yeah. Off, I think it was. Wow. What and I photo. saw that. And I was like, Yo, what is what is that? Like, how do I? What is this photo is sad, but it it makes me feel a certain way. Um, and then. I just started trying to like whatever the, it's candid. So that means I have to just catch what it is. And I started diving more into that. And then I got shown um, uh, Eugene uh, W. Eugene Smith's work. And I was like, Yo, so this is this is really a thing. Like, this is really a genre. And I'm looking at it and I'm not trying to copy um, what was made. And as you know, being a, a you know creative yourself, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Yes, it's just who has it now. And I was like, I want to do that. And I want to do that with my for my friends and my family. I don't know. I don't know what constitutes as good or bad, but I just want to make something that feels good, you know, or feels similar to what I felt when I seen those images. So if there was any like type of advice to that, just peruse any all any and all of the genres of photography and see which ones mostly like resonate with you. And if you don't know, we are in the wonderful age of information where you can just type in Google. <laughs> different genres of photography yeah. <laughs> and see what comes up might be a bit overwhelming when you when you do a first research but uh again there, there, this is why there's people like like yourself like myself who are happy to share you know what we've learned our mistakes some of the successes we have we had and uh and and the learning process speaking of successes so you went from you know being in the military having a you know huge interest in photography to being published in the New Yorker, the New York Magazine, the Cut, New York Times. So, holy um, crap. So how, how are, were you pinching yourself sometimes waking up in the morning? Like, how, how did that happen? <laughs> I know well, it's hard work. You did put the work in, but, you know, it's still a, a very impressive growth uh, on, on, on your side. It, it, it is. It is. Um, I think when, when that happened, most of that occurred um, in, in 2020. You know, now that's up for debate if, they just wanted somebody who was black to 
give their insight on Black Lives Matter or whatever the case may be. But I didn't I didn't go out to make work during that time with any intention of the work being published anywhere, being sold anywhere or anything like that. Um, I just felt that I needed to be outside. Um, how else can I contribute? I contribute with my camera. So I just went out. I made sure I went to all the events. And I was a protester first before a photographer in these events because it affects me. It affects my family. It affects my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephew. You know what I mean? And I was out doing that. And then a teacher, while I was, I was still a student, mind you, at, at SVA, uh, a teacher of mine, um, Ann Weathersby, special shout out to her. She said, hey, yo, this is a really good work. Like, do you mind if I just like send this to somebody like to look at? Sure. Whatever. Back to another day of shooting for me. And that lady, uh, that lady hit me up and was like, hey, I just saw your work and I love what you have. And we would like to publish you in this, this. And, you know, can you uh, can you hop on a call real quick? And took a call and then one led to another, which led to another, which led to another. And it ultimately led to me being able to photograph all the things that I was interested in. And somebody else took an interest in the things that I had an interest in. And that's what made it interesting. Nice. Nice. So the, the power of connection, right? So somebody, you know, that saw your work and connected you to another person. So that, that again, that's very powerful. And for that, you need to, to your point, to get out, to shoot, not necessarily with the intention of making money out of it, or but just mm -hmm. to express yourself. And there will be somebody out there who will look at the work and connect with it. We're 8 billion people on this. Actually, we're more than that. So it's there, there's, there must be somewhere, somehow. Uh, a, a person that will connect with the work. And that's something that's not very popular right now on social media. You know, social media tends to all go a certain way and, and, and tells you that if you want to be successful, you need this amount of likes or you need to shoot a certain way. You need a nice silhouette and whatever whatever's trending on, on, on TikTok and, and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think if you put in, to your point, the work that is connecting with you, then, you know, this is more long term. This is more something that you will be able to benefit from on the long run and not just quick hits of likes on social media. I, I'm not against social media. We're on social media. We use it, you know, day in and day out. But I think you have the right approach where, yes, you're posting your work, you're sharing your work, but you're also dedicating time to long term projects. So, yeah. So, so long term projects. Talk to me about that. I'm, I'm, I'm going through your portfolio and some of the some of the projects that you have. How do you go about starting a project? That's something that a lot of people struggle with. It's easier to take a nice image than to invest into a long-term series. So how, how do you approach a, a project like that? You got to you gotta know what you care about, I think. Um, what are you interested in? Even very little or even a lot is people think they have to make work that Ever, that everybody else has to like, but you lose yourself in that process. Yeah. You to please everybody. Like, what do you like? Take an interest in what you like and you'd be surprised what um what can happen. So I just put my camera in front of anything that I want to learn, learn more about, or just thought was pretty interesting. Maybe it doesn't go far. Uh, maybe the project changes. Maybe it is. But I think it's more important now to find out what you care about and document it because I feel like photography is under attack with this AI stuff. So <laughs> yes. good luck to those who are in the main portrait world and landscape world. You know, I feel like working on projects is what has you kind of adds more value to the work that you're creating because you kind of have to be there. It's, it's very authentic in the genre in which most of us work in, especially like documentary photojournalism. It's it's important to be there. It's important to have that interaction with the with with, with these other people to to show the the human side of it all, and that also keeps me from shooting all randomly and willy nilly when I'm outside. Like you know, I'm always focused on a one of the many projects I'm shooting for. You know, so that way I, my eyes open to something instead of just saying, "Oh, that looks cool. That's a cute little thing." Like, yeah, you can still take it, but I try to shoot for my projects. Yeah, man. There's one that really connects with me, and you'll understand why. Uh, that Daddy Duty project, right? So, I mean, this is, I have two daughters, and uh, I actually see myself in some of the scenes that you're capturing, and uh, that's very, very touching. So, how, how the idea came about to, uh, 
you know, document that very important function, which is being a dad to, to kids? I mean, I didn't really take a look at it until I seen this ad maybe late 2018. Uh, it was a holiday ad from Macy's, I believe, and they were under fire for that. That they put out an ad where it had these photos of different combinations of families, except for one that had like a black dad and with a black mom in it. They even had like a black man with a white man ad for holidays, for like a family holiday ad. Okay. And then it got me to thinking, like, I don't recall seeing dads on the uh, the diapers ads uh, I, and, I've, and i've bought many a diapers um <laughs> i don't see the dads on the ads for parenting like yeah. or in cover of parenting magazines um and it just started hitting me a little weird like that's not, i'm a dad my brother's a dad my dad's a dad like yep. and they're all <laughs> black fathers and i've seen this i have friends who were becoming dads I don't I don't like what this is doing. So I just decided to dive into it and look at it more. And the more I looked into it, the more I seen that yeah, there was like this imbalance of showcasing um fatherhood, especially black fatherhood. So I just wanted to do what I could do and use my camera to document that. Uh, you know, I would, it started off with me um just seeing dads out and uh, out out and about with their children and asking if I can make a portrait of them and they would say, Yeah, I'll get the information and I'll send them a photo just so they can have it. You know, like to show like, here's your proof that, you know, you were you were here. Here's something for you and your kid. Even if you don't take another photo again with each other, you got one, you know. So we did. I, that started growing. And I was like, oh, I really like this. I started meeting with some of my friends, documenting them with their experience navigating fatherhood. And then COVID came in. Yeah. 2020. <laughs> it took a different approach. I'm not, you know, I'm not allowed to go to people's houses anymore. It's a lot of things. So it was discouraging. But it didn't stop me. Um, I just made sure that I still photographed the dads outside from a distance. Like I would get that or catch interactions of dads taking care of their kids. And I, and you know, being a, a dad yourself, you kind of get foresight into what's about to happen with a dad and a kid when they're out. So you kind of, it's like, it's like a cheat code, if you will. But when <laughs> you're photographing children as a man, it gets kind of gets tricky. So with me being a dad and understanding it and another father seeing that I'm a father, he's like, oh, OK, like we'll have a conversation real quick about it. And then he's like, I like that, you know, and what makes me realize I'm on the right path with that is I've met so many fathers who have like some have cried, shared these experiences with me about like, yo, this is really important that nobody thinks about us as this. You know, we, we feel like second class citizens and to a certain extent, I relate. I relate. Um some people might disagree and that's okay. Um, but I, I could relate to that. And I wanted to make sure I continue to showcase that, continue to celebrate fathers. Right now it's just a, it's really pinpointed on black fathers because that's what's really close to home for me. But it's, it's the common thread through all fathers, you know, but it, the, it, raising these children. Yeah. And, and, and that's actually a great example of, again, something that was very personal to you and you've got the, 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 the black fatherhood angle to it. I'm, I'm white. <laughs> I don't know how to say it differently, uh, but I do relate to that project too. So this is a prime example of, again, the universal language that is photography and storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it transcends, you know, colors, boundaries, countries, whatever. Oh, yeah. If you're drawn to an image, you're drawn to an image. Doesn't, doesn't matter. You know that that the, the actual angle to it. It's nice to understand what was the creative process and why the photographer or the artist decided to go that route. But again, if you connect with an image, that's what's so beautiful about it. And I'm so fascinated. And I, I guess you are too. You're a bit like me. It's one frame. It's a fraction of a second that will never come back in time. Yet we get the luxury of capturing and putting it on a sensor on film. Uh, and 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 that for me is just still to, to this date. I've been shooting for I don't know twenty years. And I still, to this day, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that we get drawn into such a still, old school type of medium, right? It's a one frame type mm -hmm. of approach. When uh, in, in the world of, to your point, AI, TikTok, and all this great stuff, this is one frame that gets one chance to be seen, and yet we feel stuff. Like you said, we, we it can bring tears, it can bring emotion. That's yeah. that's freaking awesome. <laughs> And, and, and that's what I think is important for photography, like to, to elicit some type of emotion. You know, um, if I had to have any critique of 
the world we're living in today, it's a lot of people just doing whatever the internet tells them. Like in some ways, I think we are already bionic, you know, like, cause we have to use technology, our machines or whatever to kind of get through our, our day for some people, if you will. And nobody really knows who they are. Sometimes I feel like no one really knows who they are. Like they just go with the flow of whatever the internet trend is. So I think us making the work that we're making reminds people that, yeah, you are human. You feel this because although you're not a black father, you're still a father. You felt that. And uh, last month I had a woman, a white woman who's a mother tell me that that work that she's seen is amazing. She feels it's amazing and that it reminded her of her relationship with her dad. Although it wasn't the greatest, she learned to super appreciate the relationship that her children's father have with the kids, you know? And it was like, that's, that's interesting. That's not something I thought about when making this work. I didn't think because people were trying to make it seem as if it was like a mom versus dad debate. And you're never going to have that debate with me about mom versus dad with this work, because this has nothing to do with moms. This is just the highlight on dads. Now you take it how you want to take it. You can, but I just want dads to feel seen, feel good. Like just a little, you know, thank you for seeing me. Because how often do you get that? You know, we yeah. get it from the, we get it from our children every now and then in the way that they. But, you know, if you had to compare it to Mother's Day. Yep. I you know, know. Comple- <laughs> completely agree. Completely agree. We, we could use a bit of a, you know, uh, push. Um, so, and, and this is so true. I, I also released a, and this is kind of new to me. I'm, I'm newer to like long term series and so on and so forth. It was always in the back of my mind, but I decided to, you know, jump in and, and stop the madness of just feeding algorithms mm-hmm. and i started uh and it's funny you say human it's more human because my project's called humans after all and um it actually focuses on the visual po- poetry that we see day in and day out on in this one frame but it's very organic it's very like untouched scenes or to your point candid moments that you're not influencing but you, you capture and then when you put the body of work together it starts to make sense so for me again i'm, I'm fascinated about long-term projects and you've been doing a, a, a lot of very interesting long-term projects. What is the what is the place of storytelling in in what you do? Because I understand that you like to, you know, create a body of work that's consistent. Your use of black and white is also a, a way for you to be consistent. But how, how do you tell that story through the frames that you decide to assemble together? I Again, it comes back to knowing myself. I learned so much about myself and this work, working as a photographer that I have to be honest with myself in these in these moments. So even if I'm in a place where I can make photo, uh, make an image that works with a project that I'm doing, how do I gotta take that inv- that self inventory? How do I feel right now? What's the best way to photograph how I feel right now? And it might be very basic, it might be very basic, but I try to strive from emotion. I try to start from an emotion, um, and then build on it from there. Um, it helps. It helps. It, it really helps. But you also have to take into consideration how somebody else might view it. And that's when the professional part of photography comes in. You know, you got to know the angles and the composition and this and that. And how is it going to read? If I can look at an image and I say, this is an image about such and such, but the viewer doesn't see such and such, it didn't come off right. Then you've missed the point. Yeah, I'm not telling the story right. So how can I do that? And I try to make sure I, I, photo, I keep that photographic discipline either digitally or on film, but always remain the same in that. That I start from an emotion, I keep that same discipline and make sure what I'm trying to get across visually comes across. Now, sometimes it's difficult because you can't always tell the story in the in just the images. You know, so there's an, even with my dad duty project, there's definitely an audio component to it as well, where, you know, I'm talking to dads, but not everything allows me to have an audio component, like one project with the Lane Street Project Cemetery. I really just want you to see the cemetery. I really just want you to see how it's left in desecration. I want you to see what they're doing to people that have passed. I don't really want to talk about it because we don't have to talk. This is not something we have to talk. I just want you to see it and feel something. So it's important to for me to make sure I, I look at every scene that I'm in and find the best way to connect to what I'm trying to say. Chris, you mentioned something very interesting. You talked about audio. I'm an audiophile. I'm a musician, and I love sound. I mean, just look look at this microphone that I'm talking through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but at the end of the day, 
we don't see a lot. I mean, I know there are multimedia, let's call it this way, projects out there. But talk to me about about audio. Like, how, how do you how do you create or how do you use audio to enhance a story? And how do you go about it? Like, literally, technically, how do you share the work uh, with images and and audio? Um, well, it, I try to interview anybody like that I find interesting and. This is back into the dad do the project. I would, you know, interview them, ask them some questions, and ultimately listening to it back and then looking at the photos while I'm going through them and culling and things, you get a better sense of it. It only helps enhance the story. It doesn't make it better or worse. It can only it, it only enhance the story because it's another component, another sense that somebody has to take in. And I think audio can be um can be great to add to a collection of photographs because images are so silent yeah. and sometimes it's about more to the story than the image. And I get that. Um, it, initially it started off with just having the text, but sometimes people don't want to read the text all day. Like, so it's easy. It's for sometimes to just have the audio with the photos and let them take in this experience, at least with those two senses. So do you post it on your website? Do you, how, how do you go about it? Well, right now everything is saved on a file from the dads that I've interviewed on my computer because Got I'm it. trying to, work how I am going to showcase this said project but I use my phone to record these conversations yeah. because I don't want too many pieces of equipment already I'm already in somebody's space with a camera yeah you know I don't want them to think there's another piece like, oh here's a here's another camera recording video here's another record this here's a zoom recorder for that like I don't want to I want it to be as very small a small footprint as possible and I so I just use my phone I put it down on the table or something, and in a few seconds after a couple questions, they forget the phone is even there, and we're just having the whole conversation. Um, and it works. Yeah, it works. Some phones not all are, the time. Phones are more than enough that you you know to, to capture <laughs> audio notes. Did you know? I mean, I, I know you shoot Fujifilm uh, and other brands, but Fujifilm uh, mainly. I I didn't know that, but lately I found out that there are there is a note audio note feature on some of those. X series cameras. I think the X Pros and the XTs. What? Uh, yeah. Well, maybe we should talk about that after the show and or maybe oh, put okay. a link down below to <laughs> some tech YouTubers that are talking about that. But uh yeah, it's it's maybe you could ditch the phone and use the camera to do the audio note. Um yes. yeah. That, we'll talk about that for we'll, sure. We'll talk I like about that. that. We'll talk about that. Um so 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 Chris, talk to me about um the importance of documenting your own neighborhood i know you're, you're you're present in your in your neighborhood you were born in new york now in rally north carolina some people are, are, think they need to travel to start photography to, to capture an interesting stories um, what, what's your view on that you don't you don't have to travel although it seems nice and on paper it looks like a beautiful a beautiful theory but each person every new person that you meet is an, op is an opportunity to travel either in time or even in even to the future, you, when you talk to people about their goals or the things they've come from, each person is an individual trip. So you can do that, like find, and you'll just find people. Without my camera, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> But when I have my camera, it's like a an opportunity to like take this adventure, speak to these people, um, and then also give them a, a a platform to stand on to say something that they might have wanted to say. Like maybe they got words of wisdom for somebody else that maybe I can't use it, but somebody else can, but let, let me at least give you the platform to do so. And it's just a good thing to do. Treat others the way you would like to be treated, you know, with respect, Some, have a conversation with me. Don't judge me. You know, don't come with no pre with your, with, with your prejudice, like just have a just sit down. And I'm usually drawn to, and I think this is a photographer's crutch sometimes too, but I think for, for the right reasons, I'm drawn to individuals that are like unhoused, you know, because, yeah. In my heart of hearts, I feel like we're all just one bad day away from that. And but it doesn't take from who they are as a person. I've met people that are unhoused that um, used to be accountants and they're really smart. Like mm -hmm. they're really good with numbers and they're really good with this. But they just had a bad day that just kept spiraling or some people end up spiraling and getting on drugs. And then it's like it causes a, that's a whole nother world of problems, you know, but I like speaking with them because sometimes it it it. it anchors them back to reality sometimes and also myself yeah you know, to, to good remain reminder out. yeah yes and you don't you don't have to go across the world to do that when you can go right outside 
You can go right next door. You can go right downtown. I love going to downtown areas and meeting people because that's like the hub of everybody. Yeah. You yeah. never know what comes from that. So I'm always open to that. I love it. I think you said something very powerful. So meeting people is an opportunity to travel. I think that that reframes, you know, what traveling means and uh, being inspired by other human beings. I think that's that's something that uh, we, we tend to forget. And we're bom bombarded by messages that tells you, again, uh, from the internet or TV, whatever, that you need to be a certain place to be happy or travel a certain destination to see new things. But I think we've just uh, you've just demonstrated that this is entirely not true and there's ways to be creative and to you know, be inspired by our own surroundings. And I left and, and, and I left New York City and people looked at me like I was crazy. Like, yo, why would you leave New York City? Like, this is the hub of opportunity for you. Like, you could you could do this and this and this and this. It just wasn't it wasn't for me. I needed I needed something else. I didn't I didn't I felt like I was surviving New York and not living there. And I needed. I think a lot of people can relate to surviving yeah. New York. <laughs> yeah, I, I, needed, I needed some some something to reset me. Um And on all different levels, artistically, emotionally, mentally, I just needed to reset. And I knew and I knew New York City wasn't going to give me that. And I didn't intentionally plan on moving to North Carolina. I had no idea. I just knew I needed to get out. Um, and the final straw in the hat was my daughter. She was 11 years old at the time, looked at me and was like, Daddy, you're not happy here. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if my kid can see it, that means... It's 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 real. Yeah. Like he has no reason to lie to me about that. And ultimately, too, as an artist, you look at it like, yo, it might be in the work, too. You know, I had an opportunity to look back at some of the photographs I made during that time. And you can tell I felt very isolated. But at the same time, like stuck in a crowded place, I didn't have an escape from my thoughts and feelings. And I moved and I came down here and. When I had to alter my thinking, I had to alter the way I, I make work, how I approach making work, all of these opportunities, more opportunities that I, I would have never probably gotten in New York City had, had opened up to me here. Mm -hmm. um, I met people here that felt more like family than some people that I've lived around my whole life. You know, it, it's, it's, it was like this weird transition and it felt like it was exactly what I needed, but I didn't have to move to Europe to do it. I didn't have to move to a country in Africa to do it. I didn't have, I don't have, I didn't have to take a trip somewhere to do it. I just went eight hours south. Yeah. And and so talk to me a bit about the again, we, we, we keep hearing a lot of and no offense to them. They they live there, they're they're happy, uh, they take photos in New York and and in in London and so on. But talk to me about being in a a different type of city What are the types of uh, of stories that, that that unfolds, and what 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 keeps you motivated to go out on those streets and, and document it day in and day out in North out in North Carolina? Or, oh, in North Carolina, yeah, it's um, there's a lot of there's a lot of rich history here. Yeah, a lot of rich history here, especially Black history here. You know, um, a lot of the 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 people, a lot of the Black people that live up north, family originates from here, like down here in the Carolinas and other parts of the American South. And during the great exodus, when they made this move up there to, you know, for a better opportunity, you come back down here, this, I have this feeling of belonging here. Like, you know, I feel like, all right, well, I go to New York, I'm working, but when I come here, I feel like I'm supposed to be here. And then in, in the process of learning this history, you start realizing that a lot of our history starts right here, you know? And it, it feels like a, like a welcome home kind of, being that, you know, I, I can trace my roots, you, you know, back to Africa. It's just the the South, I feel, is the closest back to home I'm going to get. And I feel that here. Like the the other people that I meet here, they welcome me with with, with just love and oh, come into my home and let's, let me feed you. Like, let's talk <laughs> about these things. Let's, let's learn from each other. And it's it's been really good. In New York, that's not really happening for me. Maybe it's not a lot of space. <laughs> or uh, some people are, people are extremely secretive or it's just somebody got so, so many people got so many things going on they're having a hard time finding that time to slow down to even appreciate somebody wanting to know their story yeah. you know and, and i'm not bad mouthing new york i want new yorkers to understand i love new york i'm gonna always love new york my mindset my hustle my grind is from being raised in new york i get it but we we need an escape from that sometimes and the south has provided that for me I can I can totally relate when I I love going to New York. 
I'm, I'm actually a couple hours away in Montreal. And this is a city that uh, I love to go, love to document, love to shoot in. Um, but some of my friends are living there. They're like, dude, you don't, you don't want to live here. <laughs> no. you, I, I completely understand your point about surviving New York. Uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, some people love it. Some people thrive on it. But um, I think you have to have a certain type of personality to be able to navigate to your point into a city like like new york hey it is the most you know bustling city in the world so it's there's advantages and then there's you know yeah always yeah, yeah. always it's always advantages but it's also it's also a lot it's like um i call it like a gladiator school type of thing for like anything <laughs> going through in life like if you want to be a creative if you want to be a business mogul or something you have to spend a little bit of time in new york yeah to get to get some grit on you get some scars a little bit and that, you know that's why they say if you can make it in new york you can make it anywhere and i and i wholeheartedly believe that because anybody i know that has left new york they're not hurting any and, and nowhere near hurting as if they how they were when they were in new york yeah yeah so you know, it's it, it it it's something to it it has its own little its own little things absolutely so some people on, on, on some listeners like to know what the creators are using as tools again this is not a gear show i don't want it's, this to turn mm -hmm. into a gear conversation but you and i've made a joke pre-show that uh, i saw you with 17 different cameras on you but you're a man <laughs> of uh very various tools so can, can you walk us through a bit of the tools you use to, to create those beautiful uh, stories day in and day out if it works i use it from film to digital but right now primarily um It's digital and it's Fuji gear, X Pro, X 100 V, XT4, X70, XF10. Like X, X70, man, I, I, it's right here for me, and uh, it's the forgotten camera. Probably one of my favorite cameras that Fuji has put on the market. It's so small, so powerful, and uh, looks good too, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a sleeper, man. It's a sleeper camera. Like people are catching on now, so yeah. that's why the is going up for the x70 um same with the um with the x pro 2s mm -hmm. for whatever reason and some re and the x pro 1s too for some reason it are like They're coming going back up in price yeah yeah um but i think what i like about it is that it keeps it's, it's they're quiet they're light um it's not intrusive and i think that helps aid me in getting some of those intimate moments for example in the dad duty project if my camera was yeah You know how easily somebody like the human eye will look at me like because they hear that and they want to what's that noise but it'd be so silent and it's like I, it's, i'm not interrupting yeah anything some people say yeah i didn't even know you, you took the photo like <laughs> i know you mentioned you shoot film uh, do you still shoot film today with these uh crazy prices that's that we why i took a break that right? is why <laughs> i right. took a break from shooting film because it's, it costs but i i do bring it out every now and then as nice conversation starters for people Um, if I'm in the mood to meet new people, I'll definitely take out um, I'll take out Mamma Mia C330. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, I'll take it out, and it's always a conversation starter. People are like, oh, is that what a old school camera? How does it work? And I'm like, let me show you. Stand right here. Let me get it. Stay, and I get a stand still. Stand account. still. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> well, I, I take it out with a tripod now. Oh, there you go. Okay. Or the uh, Mamiya RB67 that I've recently acquired in the last couple months. Um, I have a bunch of 35 millimeter film cameras, like more than I should have. Uh, any I've, any go to 35 mil uh, camera that, that you prefer? Icon F3, baby. Oh man, that's such a Icon classic. Icon F3. Uh, you know, it. I got friends who, 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 want, who talks about the F4 and then the F2, but the F3 for me, I like that. I, I think I'm it's really probably one of the m most well built camera in history of cameras. <laughs> It's nice, man. It's nice. I, it was so nice. I brought it twice and ultimately sold them. But I would love to get them back um, yeah. when I'm ready for that life. When I have a bunch of money, I can spend on shooting film. But yeah, man, that's yeah. that's not cool, man. Kodak and I, I understand their business and it's offer and demand and and supply chain. But uh, man, it's 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 becoming, you know, something for the rich people to do. Like I don't know, like the rich kids. Uh, <laughs> Weird. it's weird it's weird it, it's going up but like people that that love it are gonna find a way to get it you know there's some people that bulk roll yep. um bulk excuse me bulk load their film and there's some people that just like it is what it is i'll i'll just pay the price because I, if i could afford to do it it's, it's for me i don't want something to stop me from being able to shoot that's all yeah and i don't want that price of that to be like man i can't shoot film today because it costs this much money to 
before I roll or this. So the digital comes right in handy and shooting Fuji allows me to customize the the colors and things the way that I want it to be. So do you use the film sims um, in the, in the, yeah, yeah. I, I've played around with them more than enough times to get looks that I'm happy with. Cause I don't really like spending too much time at the computer. So once they work out that clarity issue in the camera with that delay, that two second the, delay is killing them. man. it's uh, I, I gave so many emails for feedback emails to, to Fuji. I'm a Fuji shooter too. And like, but um, I, I, it's just guys, you're one bug away. I call it a bug because two seconds in this world is too long uh, mm -hmm. to reload, well, not to reload, but to, to, to come back to life. Yeah, they took another shot. It's just like, it's yeah. doing a little loading. I'm like, is it the card? I brought high speed cards thinking it was the card. It's not the card. But I mean, they, they've got a processor that could, that actually is, is more powerful than what was used to send people to the moon. So I'm sure they can figure out a way to process that data faster. Oh, and it's a clarity slider. Like it's not a, it's not an HDR slider or something like that. It's just a clarity slider. Anyways, we, we can, uh, we're, we're going on a rant now about that. We love Fuji. We love you, Fuji camera, Fuji company. Um, so, so uh, enough about gear. I, I, I want to go back to um, artistic choices. So you love black and white. Uh, a lot of your work is in black and white. Um, so why, why do you love black and white? I guess that's my question. It's what I was introduced to mostly when I was going down this rabbit hole of black photographers and the work that moved me was pretty much all color, maybe 90% color until I seen some of Gordon Parks' more fashion work that was in color. But what I liked about black and white versus color is that black and white gets you straight to the point of the emotion of the image. Color can do the same, but it requires a more things to take into consideration. But when I'm making work, those moments be so spontaneous. That's what I'm focusing on that moment. And, you know, I don't I, I don't want to have to focus on a moment. And then it, that moment is lost because there's a yellow sign in the back and a red car. And I don't want I don't want to I don't want your eye to take this whole journey through the frame before you get to the emotion. I want the emotion that hit you just like that. And then you're like, oh. Okay, I see what this is. This is beautiful. That's why people, when I talk to people, they look at my work and they're like, yo, I love this. This this makes me feel like this, or this makes me remember a time like that. That's what I'm going for. Not to say color doesn't do it. I, I, I'm sure you've seen some of my work that's in color too, yep, but yep. primarily black and white for me, especially when it's emotional. When it's color for me, it has to be about the color. It Like it has to be about the color. It can't just be in color. A kid crying in color, like that's not... It's not it for me. It has to work. It yeah. has to work. It's a beautiful song when you can get color images to like work. <laughs> I agree. I agree, and it uh, re removes any distraction. And I, I, I was interested in also learning about the thought process. I, I see two projects, Pride and Be Careful, that are in color. Um, mm -hmm. On the opposite side, why, why did you decide? Uh, Pride, I can see. I can already see why you went color, but uh, maybe oh. being careful. Uh, um, why, why did you decide to do color on that one? Um, because I wanted to show the diverse group of women that go through those issues. I didn't want it to be a straight, um, this is a black woman thing, this is a white woman thing, this is an Asian woman thing. Like I didn't, that's not what it is. The the whole ultimate piece of it is women's safety. Um, and I didn't want that to be in black and white to distract you from what's going on. I mean, not to distract, excuse me. I don't want, I didn't want to put it in black and white for you to be like, oh, I don't even know if they're black or white. Let's just talk oh, about it. I want you to see the diverse people that's having the same issue. Yeah, it's enough that already separates us as people. But I wanted you to see that, like, it's not just a one woman type of thing. That's that's a very good reason. Uh, thank you for uh, for giving us the uh, the context, uh, Chris. What, what what would you like, you know, your body of work to have as an impact or legacy for the for the photography community? I think you're, you're investing enough time effort. And you're so passionate about it. So I'm interested in uh, learning a little bit more about where do you see the work going and what would you like to be remembered for? I mean, you're super young, so it's a very early question. But what's that path that you're on? Um, selfishly, I would love to see the museums, galleries, nice. book, you know, but ultimately, what, which I, I would take and just be OK with is that I make a body of work that my daughters are proud of. Hmm that when they become adults themselves they can learn about their dad through the work and if any other questions they had that they felt that they didn't get to ask me they can see in the work and see what i cared about and seeing how even seeing how i love them through the work just 
I want that to be able to speak for me um, when I when I'm gone, or even when I'm just old and I'm still here, and they don't, you know they just living their lives that they can go back to the work and be like this is a world that my dad has lived through. Here's how he navigated it, um, and I know he's working hard for us to have the opportunity. And then ultimately, whenever I become worm food, they are in charge of the work, and yeah, they can do something with it. Either yeah, you want to sell it, sell it. If you want it to be inspirational to you do that but i want to give them a fighting chance you know with with the work that i'm making because i didn't my family we don't have that for me at this and this at least in this generation like we we're building we're trying to still build something but i want them to become adults and then have something that they have a foundation that they can build on that's very uh very legit and very inspiring i think uh to your point it changes everything when you when you have kids right so uh, it, it changes the the perspective on life Uh, on why you do things, you know, I, I like to start with why. I think it was Simon Sinek who was uh, who wrote a book about starting with why, and that this was very powerful for me because that's the best question to ask yourself. And again, when you have kids, it replaces everything uh, a bit differently than when you're a selfish, you know, twenty year old trying to make it. <laughs> you know, why, why is my favorite question? I even had it got it tattooed on my hand. Oh, so there you go. My camera up, I see it right here, so that. I remember, like, why am I making this photo? Like, why is it necessary? Why do you care? And why should anybody else care? It's like, these are the questions that that play every time I'm looking through this viewfinder trying to figure it out. And, and some people don't look at the why. It's just they're really having fun just making work. And there's nothing wrong with Which that. Which is fine. Exactly. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're a hobbyist, you know, like, say you're a hobbyist. But when you start sliding into the world saying that you're, you know, you're an artist or you're an artist that works in this medium, you have to understand that. The work is not about just you anymore. You have to understand how other people are going to view it. Do you, you think? Know? Do you think a a single photograph can change the world? It can, and it's been proven. Yep, it's been proven. Look at the photographs of Emmett Till. Yep, you know, I mean, it didn't change it so much so that police brutality and all racism has 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 stopped, but it made more people aware to know that this exists. And this is the extent things can go to if we don't get a hold on it. History will be doomed to repeat itself. So I think, yeah, it can. But I think if you really want to change the world, you're going to need a series of images. You got to tell those stories on a deeper, deeper level, a more relatable level, because anybody can look at one image and come up with their own idea. But once you provide the context and you provide some some other stuff to help build on it, I think it could only help. It's not one better than the other. I think it could just only help. And I think you're right because we are exposed to so many images more than ever. Uh, as a matter of fact, moving images, uh, stills images, and I think the voice of the photographer is becoming more and more important because of the overload of information and images and, and AI generated stuff that we see. So I think to your point, if you start with why and you're clear on that, and then it trends. And, you know, translates into your work and how you present your work. I think we're onto something, you know, versus just taking nice images. To your point, nothing wrong with taking nice oh. images of your girlfriend when you travel. Nice, oh. put it on Instagram, get the likes and enjoy, and uh, and do something else. But to your point, if you're investing time, effort in your art and in the craft uh, of photography, then then it's a bit a bit of a different approach. So I I, I hope uh, that listeners are are understanding that. Um, Man, this this has a lot of potential. Photography is not something that's just you know cameras and technology. It's it's something that can change the world and that can make you a, a different person or a better person or somebody who has a voice and and something to say in the world. It's the reason why people can go to Google Images and see things like there you walk go. around, and look, look around, and look at some of these these advertisements. Look at these things like. Photography can be an, an, an artistic outlet. It can be a, a job. It can be all of these things. And you don't you don't realize how much of it you need or how much it influences what we got going on until you like take a real strong look at the world around you. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, that somebody made that photo and somebody made that photo. Mm. Somebody made that. Like you've seen a model in an outfit of clothes that you probably bought. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's 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 like that. It's like it, you When you look at it, you start realizing how intertwined it is with the world. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of the the world, uh, where uh, are you going next? What's next for your 
you know, photography and, and the projects you're working on and where can people find out more about the, the work you're producing? Um, well, I don't know where I'm going just yet. <laughs> That's um, fine. <laughs> I, let, I, usually, I usually just let the photography guide me in those, some of these places or let the universe take me where I need to go. I'm um, trying to just go with the flow. But if you, for anybody that's trying to see my work, you can always go to my website first, yeah. uh, www.cocobuttershutter.com. Please come take a look at that. You can also look at Instagram like the rest of the world too, but I recommend the website. <laughs> but you can check out Instagram. But as long as you're seeing the work and you and you take an interest, please feel free to reach out to me on, on my website. Uh, there's Twitter as well. My Instagram is Coco Butter Shutter as well. Uh, Twitter is Coco Butter Shutter. Just, but I think butter and shutter just doesn't have uh, the last ease in them on uh -huh. Twitter. So before we end the show, why why cocoa butter shutter? That's hard to say for a Frenchie like me. Cocoa butter <laughs> shutter, cocoa, but whatever. <laughs> why, so, why why the name? <laughs> at first, I just really wanted something when I, when I made it. I wanted something to let people know that I really care about like the black experience. Nice. You know, photographing that, and people laughed at the name at first. And and now they love it. People say, "Yo, this is one of the coolest names I've ever heard." And and I think about it in the sense of when you think of black bodies, one of the best things we could put on our skin is cocoa butter. Oh, oh. right. And That's nice. I'm, a lot of my body of work is about black people. So, what's the best thing to have if you need to tell a story of black bodies? Cocoa butter. Come, well, come with me. Well, I I think it's a very nice uh, way to end this show. Um, again, I will put all the links that Chris and I discussed today in the show notes. And I want to thank you personally, Chris. I think this has been a very interesting conversation, inspirational. We talked about you know, your work, about the gear a bit, and also more importantly about the art of photography. So that was a, I want to thank you personally. And also, if you want to give this podcast a five-star review, it would be tremendously appreciated because we want more people to hear about Chris work and you know all the great photographers and artists that I'm interviewing on that show so please do that share it with your friends give it give it a five-star review and I'll see you in the next episode so Chris have a good one and Thanks. talk to you soon